Hey gamers, it's Winterbute here from Grind This Game. Back with uh, Oxygen Not Included, the jobs update, which is coming out now in two days. And this video is going to be a bit of a review of kind of all the system but systems I have set up. I got a few comments, one from Nalu and one from Nico, asking if I could kind of go over some of the stuff I've built. So if that kind of review episode isn't for you, then you can stop now, but uh, I'll be going over that and I'll also be going over the steam turbine and the changes to it. Um, with this update, they have all the debugging kind of stuff turned on, like crash crash detection and stuff. So the game runs really slow, but I'll probably start a new base um, either tomorrow or the next day. I might wait until it's fully out because then all the optimizations will be turned on. Or I might just start a new base because the first first you know hundred cycles of a base are still pretty fast even with all the debug stuff. And I might even try to load this base up, um, but it's kind of been tainted because I've done a few debug things uh, in it. So I'll probably start with the cooling because um, people were asking about that. As you can see, it's really slow. So I've got two of these. They're called Borg supercoolers or Borg coolers. I think Saturnus uh, from the Clay Forums, he's a big player of this game. I think he came up with this design. Now, I, I didn't fully do the design properly here, but but the main concept is that you use something like oil, which has a low freezing point of minus 40, and you set up a pump, and you just circulate the oil to an aqua tuner, which cools it by 14 degrees so it's going in at 11 it's coming out at minus 3 and then you just circulate it and you dump it back in the tank now if you the magic happens with this metal tile here if you don't have the tile uh, the, it still does cool down the oil but it takes much much longer there's kind of a bug with the game right now where if a small amount of cool liquid I think touches a, a larger tile of liquid the cool temperature of the tiny amount cools the whole tile. So that's that's why this little metal tile, I think the a small amount of super cold oil spills down into this tile here, which has, let's see, 244 kilograms. So what temperature is it at? It's at 2.5. So like if one gram of oil came out of here at 2.5 and this tile was at 100 degrees, I think the tiny amount of oil cools it right down. So if you start with really hot oil and you turn this thing on, within like a minute, it cools down really, really fast. So it's it's a cheat, I guess. Um, but you, even without this using the exploit, it does cool down a decent amount over a long term. And then the metal tiles here are to propagate that heat using, they have a thermal conductivity of 60. So they kind of efficiently radiate the coolness, or if you think about the heat and the water kind of radiating back into the cool. Basically the temperatures kind of equalize. So we're pumping 95, 96 degree geyser water over here. Here's our geyser. And I have some regulation here. So this pressure sensor, if the water in this tile is over 100 kilograms, then we pump some hot water over. And we dump it in dump it in this tank here. And the reason I have the regulation is that so the pump's not wasting energy running all the time. And then it drops in here. And as you can see, it's kind of warmer on the left where the hot water is going in. And cooler over here. And then this tank here is at around five degrees. It would be better if these if the water was touching, but it doesn't have to. It still will radiate, but not as well because there's air in between. But once this water tank fills up and it touches this metal tile, it will like really cool the water down quickly. But I don't want it to cool too much or the water freezes solid and can break the pipes and stuff. Where is this polluted water coming from? Oh, the ice is melting. Okay, that's okay. So that's kind of the cooling system. Like I said, without the single metal tile here, it works decently well. Uh, but with it, it, it's extremely fast. And I have some regulation here that says only activate if it's above 10 degrees. 
That's to prevent the oil from freezing solid as well. So I have a similar cooling system over here and it's not using the exploit and I'm using petroleum instead because petroleum is even better because its freezing point is minus 57. So you can get this thing really cool. So right now it's at minus one. It, it could go even colder. And in this case, I'm not just circulating it in place. What I'm doing is I'm circulating it through some wolframite pipes along here, over here, basically across all these hot areas. And this used to be kind of 40, 50 degrees, this whole area. But once I put in the cooling loop of petroleum, it uh, cooled it right down. So it's going in, or it's coming out at minus 15, and then after it passes over all this hot equipment, it's coming back at minus four. And then it goes back into this container, cools down by 14 degrees or so, and then loops through again. Now in past bases, I've built my whole power generation column and oxygen generation beside one of these anti-entropy thermo nullifiers. Because these used to cool down really, really effectively. I think they've been changed. They're not working as strongly. Uh, so they weren't able, this thing wasn't able to cool all of this effectively. So my oxygen was kind of going to the base at kind of a hot temperature. Right now it's going at zero degrees and seven degrees, which is probably on the cool side, but better to, better to have a base that's too cool and then use space heaters to do kind of localized warming than to have, you know, warm oxygen overheating your base. So yeah, like I said, this thing I thought would cool everything enough, but it what didn't, so I had to build this cooling loop. Some people build their natural gas power plants kind of three wide. I tend to just do a big long column like this because it makes the piping a little bit less confusing. So here's the CO2 piping. And I build it like this. Oh, I noticed it's backed up. I build it like this so it uh, it works better, basically. If you build it all in one long line, it can get caught up and the generators go idle sometimes. Let's go down here and see what's going on with that CO2. It was going to Slicksters before. I generally send my CO2 to a Slickster farm because they'll consume it. Oh wow, we're going way down here. Oh, we're overpressurized. Even, oh wow, that's with a high pressure vent. So we got, we have 20 kilograms of CO2 in here. That's a lot. The Slicksters can't keep up. Interesting. Now sometimes they get stuck and they stop consuming CO2. I don't know if that's the case here. Let's look at them. Sometimes you can they just get full of CO2. They seem okay. But they're not producing oil anymore. Usually you can see an animation and it says oil produced, but if you don't have enough slicksters to consume all of the CO2, then you can just use a carbon skimmer. And I was using two carbon skimmers here before, now I just have one. So we, sh we should actually make kind of a an extra pipe here. And I think I'm in, yeah, I'm in cheat. I'm in de debug mode now, so I'm just going to build it with debug mode. So if we put a vent there, if this gets backed up, then all the excess will just flow through and the scrubber will eat it. And if this starts to fill with CO2, we can always just enable the second one here. I'm using debug because this is kind of the end of the space, I think. I want to start from scratch. Everything's changed with the latest hotfix, so... Actually, most of the dupes are just idle, standing around. <laughs> okay, what else is going on up here? I usually build a somewhat big battery bank. Now batteries have changed. Now they lose a little bit of electricity um, per cycle. Yeah, if you read the description now for the battery, stores most runoff power from generators but loses charge over time. So it loses uh, two kilojoules per cycle. So building a massive battery bank isn't as efficient anymore, but 
I'll probably still build them because they prevent a bit of a buffer for any kind of brownouts that we have. Basically, if you have spiking power, just to like in, in real life, if you have a solar farm or a wind farm, it's good to have a, a battery bank for when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. So that during peak demand, um, it's being used, but then, you know, during the night, if there's demand, it can consume it from the batteries. Tesla, for instance, makes these new power wall batteries for for basically like houses that have solar roofs. You can store the power during the day if you're not using it and then use it at night. There's some other cool real world uh, powered storage like um, pumping compressed air into a cylinder or pumping water uphill into a dam and then charging it through the dam through a turbine at night or on demand. Or with the solar concentrated solar power, you can have like a, a s sodium that they heat and turn into liquid molten sodium, and then use that heat, you know, during the night. There's some cool real world stuff with uh, power storage. But I digress because that's kind of off topic. <laughs> now for the wiring in this power plant, I always use heavy watt wire because the dupes don't need to come in here very often. It's really low decor, as you can see. This is terrible. Decor, minus a thousand. Uh -huh. But it's much easier to wire up this and then just use transformers for in-base power. Because in the base, I don't really have a lot of power consumers. I try to keep almost all machinery outside of the base. So the only thing we have that's kind of generating heat in here is this uh, electric grill. The massage table, I think, makes a bit of heat and this deoxidizer, which I don't use anymore, makes a bit of heat. So all oxygen generation, all big machinery, I try to keep outside of the base. So I think I have a metal refinery back over here. Yeah. So even though this is low decor, I, us I usually put this kind of high wattage stuff. This thing takes 1200 watts, so I keep it outside of the base. Makes a bunch of heat. Actually, I'll show the setup for it. Oh, we're out of polluted water. Look at that. Oh, because I stopped doing my CO2 scrubbing? No. Hmm. Actually, that's a bit of an issue, running out of polluted water. Because that means our fertilizer makers are going to stop working. Yeah, the natural gas pressure in here is dropping quite a bit. Yeah, without polluted water, we don't get natural gas. It's kind of a bad loop to be in. I could try to find some polluted water somewhere else. Or I might just disable some some of these natural gas power plants. The base is kind of a throwaway base now. We're finishing up, so I'm not too concerned about that. This fertilizer maker room, pretty standard. I tend to make three of these fertilizer synthesizers, synthesizers for each natural gas power plant. I forgot to put in the last one. And usually the, nat the uh, polluted water from the natural gas power is enough to kind of keep this going. So what else do we have in here? I tend to build these in the same area as my geyser, but you don't need to. You could pump you could pump the natural gas from each area separately. Some people build like giant giant rooms of these. Cuz it's essentially infinite power. You could build, you know, 30 of these and then have run 10 natural gas turbines. For the wiring, I'm doing the 2 kilowatt wire conductive wire for these. And these require special uh, conductive bridges, so I'm using those as well. What else do we have going on here? I have this thermal regulator, which I probably don't need anymore. My oxygen was warm at one point, but now it's cool enough. I don't really need to bring it down to negative, negative nine degrees. I should probably just get rid of that and make it straight through. I use a bisolite as well, just so the coolness is preserved. And we gotta hook up that power again. There we go. I know that's cheaty, but like I said, this base is done. Okay, some other details about this base. Uh, if we look at the room overlay, I try to get all the room bonuses. So my greenhouses are special rooms. And they need a farm station to get the room bonus. But they don't need a dupe actually allocated to it to get the bonus. If they are allocated to it, they'll make this uh, plant food, 
which kind of boosts the yield of the plants. But I only have two farmers and I have, I think, four grow rooms here. So you can see these ones are allocated, but these ones are not. I could probably make more dupes farmers because I have seven idle right now. So that gets you the growing room bonus, greenhouse bonus. And then I, I built my medical bay up here. This requires a latrine, uh, a, a mess table, and at least one medical bay or medical bed. And that increases, what does it do? It increases, oh, they're less likely to spread disease. Okay. And then we've got our tiny recreation room. Uh, we get, what do we get for that? It will relieve additional stress when they're on the massage table in here. Now, I didn't have a lot of dupes stressing out, so this was big enough, but... If you're playing on a harder setting, you might want to build, you know, more massage tables in one of these rooms. We get the bedroom bonus. Oops, wrong overlay. Yeah, we get the bedroom bonus here. And what I tend to do is leave the doors open because the dupes will be able to run in and run out faster and you still get the room bonus. What else do we have in here? We, oh, we get the mess hall bonus. Additional stress relief while they're eating in here. So I usually build these. And then finally the latrine. I think it just needs a sink. Yeah, it needs one toilet, one wash station, or a sink. So I got two of those. And the four toilets seems to be enough for the 15 dupes. It might even be overkill. Show the piping there. So the polluted water is coming out and going into this area down here. And then we're pulling it up with this pump, filtering it, and dumping the clean water here. Which they can use for plants or whatever. Now the water that comes out of the sieve, the filter, it comes out at 40 degrees. So it's a little bit warm. You've got to have some kind of way to cool this water. One thing I'll often do if we turn off the debug stuff. I was building a bunch of ice blocks above this tank and then what happens is the ice blocks slowly melt and the cold cold water goes in here and keeps it at a decent temperature i'm not really using this water for much if anything yeah it's not really going anywhere i was early game but i don't use it anymore now i'm using only the water from that top right thing which is up here our main system our one geyser and uh, this cooling tank. Now there is another geyser over here, which I didn't discover. Where is it? Right here. So if this base, if I kept it going, I'd eventually find this and tap into it. I used to have a few weasel warts throughout the base, but as you can see, it is nice and cool now. Don't need them anymore. Could probably get rid of this one. So that's all the room bonuses. And then, oh, I... I'll explain this a little bit, I guess. Got my algae distillers here, so whenever they get slime, they'll dump it in here, and the algae will pop out. Oh, I put some, I put some hatches here using the relocator so that whenever polluted dirt falls out of the sieve, they eat it up and make coal for us. The grow rooms are not optimal. Um, they were originally planters, and then I switched over to hydroponic tiles. The hydroponic tiles could be on this bottom row, and as someone commented, these lights, if they're one tile lower, they'll have a kind of a bigger radius. If we look at our, where is it? Where's our light overlay? This one. So if the lamp is one lower, it, it covers a bigger area. You could also use ceiling lights. Yeah, so this is not, far from optimal. In my next playthrough, I'll try to make this better. But you want the light to cover, you know, all your plants as best as possible. And we are putting water in there from the cooled geyser water. It's quite a bit of piping. Now I do the piping like this because if you do a pipe straight along, it uh, sometimes it gets caught up and doesn't quite work. I don't know why, but you'd think a straight pipe would work, but it does not. And as a few of you have mentioned, you can use a you used to be able to use a valve to send hot water to all three, like one valve per three planters but it, that doesn't quite work anymore. The idea was that you would 
only put in as much water as it needs to grow the plant and no more but you still get a bit of water stuck in here and it heats up the planter so you can't use 95 degree water for these anymore I like to put lots of art in my bedrooms and mess halls so that's keeps the decor high keeps their stress low I'll just go into the jobs tab here now with jobs um, the higher the profession the higher their expectations for decor so that's one of the trade-offs of getting these super skilled uh, dupes is this, you know, like tier six requires great food and high decor. And now I haven't been feeding them great food. I've been feeding them these uh, gristle berries, which are of poor quality. Now, if I was able to grow sleet wheat effectively, I would be making probably frost buns, which are plus two. Or I could grow a pinch of pepper and sleet wheat and grow grow these or make this pepper bread, which is superb. But with all the paintings, their their stress level isn't isn't going high. You can see our stress is almost zero for everyone. And then I have my exosuit dock here. I used to just have two docks, I think, originally. And I have a I have a door before it so I can control who goes in and out. Before the latest hotfix, I was only letting my exosuit engineers through because they were fast and everyone else was just painfully slow. But since the hotfix, since everyone can level athletics, I'm letting them all go down there, or almost all of them. And I disconnected the ladder here so they can't get through, so they're forced to come this way past the uh, checkpoint and then down. And I try to build fire poles when I can so they can get down quickly. And I built this one tube up so they can get back up quickly. Now at the bottom here, I have like a whole other set of machinery. This is kind of my oil setup. So I've got my uh, oil refinery. Now the crude oil is coming down from down here. I'm sending some CO2 down here for the Sixters. I should probably send my other CO2 over this way because they're uh, this is not high pressure here and they're able to eat it all. Oh wow, this oil level has come up quite a bit from all those slicksters. So I send my CO2 do down there. Now if your CO2 is cold, you want to probably vent it a bit higher so that it has time to warm up before it gets down to these slicksters because if they get too cold, they'll die. So I send my CO2 down there, got my oil refinery here, and that's, so it's bringing in oil here and it's sending petroleum out into this tank. And then some petroleum is going over to a petroleum generator just to generate excess power, uh, which I had disabled before, but now it's enabled again. This thing generates a ton of polluted water and a ton of CO2. So this will probably fill up quickly now that this is on. And then some of the petroleum is going directly to our plastic makers. How much plastic do we have? Um, 13 tons. And these, I have a little dribble of water underneath each one because they get really hot. But this water up underneath is enough to keep them cool. And it's also in an ice biome, so it's nice and cool in here. And I got a bunch of water mixed in here. So I have a filter, a liquid filter that filters out petroleum only. And everything else is dumped out here. So any water or blue water that gets in here from things melting just dumps down here. I got another battery bank here. This is probably unnecessary because I have the two grids are now connected. So we've got a 17.6 kilowatt power grid. And part of that is coming from the steam generators, which I'll show you in a sec. Now I did have my first steam turbine here and it was working before the latest hotfix. But steam turbines changed quite a bit. So what I used to do is drip water in here on this hot tile, which is at 800 degrees from the, this used to be all magma, but it's cooled down and turned into rock. So I drip water here, got lots of steam pressure, and then this thing would run. But since the hotfix, they work differently, and I'll take you up to my experiment here. So this design is roughly uh, inspired by Navatil. He did a post on the forums about his steam power setup. I just wanted to get it working, so the basic principle is you use an aqua tuner. Um, you get some water in the system 
So the aqua tuner gets really hot, and this aqua tuner right now is at 170 degrees, so it's actually breaking, or will be breaking. It overheats at 175 degrees, so I'm pumping actually petroleum through this instead of water. He was using water. So as you pump liquids through it, they, they get cooled, but they also heat up the aqua tuner, so any water that's in here that touches it will turn to steam. And the way these things work now is if you actually read the description, it says, generates exceptional electrical power when there is at least 3,000 grams more steam below it than above it. You need high pressure steam below and then low pressure here. So if you had 3,000 here and zero here, this thing takes a while to spin up, but once it spins up, it'll suck the steam from here and blow it out the top. But the issue with that is that this area becomes high pressure and you lose your you lose your differential of pressures. So I think his idea was to allow the steam to condense on this cool tile. If we look at this tile, actually it's, it's really hot now, but the idea is that you circulate a coolant through here. This area gets really cold and it cools down these tiles so that when the steam reaches the top, it condenses into water, dribbles back down through here, uh, hits the hot aqua tuner, turns into steam again, and it's kind of perpetual energy. But I couldn't get it working very well for very long because as the steam travels upwards, this becomes high pressure. But then once this one kicks in, this becomes low pressure and you get this cascading effect where they, they intermittently turn on and off. I haven't been able to get it working just right. So it's going to be a bit finicky. Um, there's other ways to remove the pressure in between by using doors to either destroy the steam or move the steam up using a cascading kind of set of doors. But both seem kind of overly complicated. I, I hope there comes a point when this just, there's a simpler setup, but maybe that won't happen. I'm not quite sure. But if we put some water in here, let's do this. Uh, so if we put some water in here, oh, that temperature was wrong. <laughs> Let's try 330. If we put a little bit of water in here, this aqua tuner is at 110 degrees. So it's going to boil that water into steam. And you can see this turbine, turbine is now powering up, spinning up. But once it, once it kicks on, Okay, our steam pressure here is 42 kilograms and up here it's 23. So it's a big enough differential, but once it turns on, it's you can see the steam pressure going down, 36, 35, 34, and this area is going up, 25, 26. But then it stops working because the differential gets too out of whack. But then because this is going up in pressure, this one kicks on, and once it finally goes all the way on, the pressure from here will go down and pressure here will go up. So now this is working. And same for the one above. And eventually, if all conditions are right, you get a nice flow. You need the water to exactly be condensing at the rate, you know, that it's being turned into steam. Let's speed this up. It's basically really finicky to get it working just right. And the other issue is that if your coolant loops too many times, this area gets too cool. That's not an issue right now, but when I was using water, it would get too cool and all this would freeze. So more experiments uh, are required here. I think this is going to be a cool set of equipment to use though, going forward for power, if I can get it working just right. So that's pretty much an overview of the base and how everything's working. Uh, I got one request for the next base to be like a base of three, so build three little mini bases and have them connected somehow maybe, or running independently. I might try something like that, or I just might try to build a nice, pretty, symmetrical, well-functioning base. We'll see. Or I might try the uh, super hard mode. So yeah, a bit of an overview episode, but the next uh, episode will be a new a new base, I think. So as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.